Damen und Herren, so kurz vor Weihnachten hier, letzte Adventswoche, aber Trump hat uns wohl alle so durchgeschüttelt, dass wir das auch am Heiligabend wahrscheinlich noch vormittags machen können und sind dann auch alle gekommen. Ich freue mich ganz ausdrücklich im Namen der Zeitschrift und mein Name ist Daniel Offer, dass Sie heute hier zu uns ins vorweihnachtliche Beterhaus gefunden haben. Bitte ja, anders, der Einfluss von Social Media auf vergangene und künftige Wahlen, etwaige Wahlmanipulation steht ja gerade in den Medien auch hoch im Kurs durch Algorithmen, durch Geheimdienste, durch Fake News, wird uns wahrscheinlich auch, und vor allen Dingen in Europa, im nächsten Jahr stehen ja viele große Wahlen an, richtig beschäftigen und deswegen sehen wir es auch als unsere Aufgabe, als Prozess Lab, darüber Veranstaltungen zu bieten, heute und auch im kommenden Jahr, um das Thema zu diskutieren, Aufklärung zu leisten äh, und eventuell die eine oder andere Lösung auch mit Beteiligten hier im Wetterhaus zu finden, weil man kann ja natürlich jedem Algorithmus auch einen anderen entgegensetzen und da sind wahrscheinlich viele kreative Köpfe unter Ihnen gefragt. Da freue ich mich, um die Überleitung zu bekommen, ganz Herzlich und ausdrücklich, dass wir einen schönen Zufall hatten vor zwei Monaten mit Cornelius vom hans berino institut zusammen saßen und diese, ja man kann sagen, heutige Sonderveranstaltung als Landstation noch kurz vor Weihnachten mit ins Programm nehmen konnten. Vielen Dank ans hans berino institut für diese Kooperationsveranstaltung heute. Vielen Dank an dich, Cornelius, für die tolle Vorbereitung. Das führt auch zu unserem ersten Gast heute, nämlich Nick. Diakopoulos. Nick ist einer der weltweit, muss man sagen, danke sehr hier auf der Bühne, äh, ausgewiesensten Experten für die Frage Datenjournalismus, Data Analysis, News Media. Äh, eigentlich Assistant Professor an der University of Maryland, aber diesen Monat Research Fellow hier in, in Hamburg am hans Brehm institut Vielen Dank. Thank you that we are having you here today. <lacht> Nick macht viele Studien zu dem Thema, wird einfach ein paar der wichtigsten Aspekte auch gleich in der Diskussion in einer kurzen Präsentation vorstellen. Ich will nur einen Aspekt rausgreifen, der mich auch besonders bewogen hat, nämlich die Analyse, um die es heute auch gehen wird, von ja, Darstellung von News über Trump. Donald Trump und Hillary Clinton in den äh, Google News Feeds, Sie kennen diese, diese Rubrik äh, in den News bei Google, also wenn man auf Nachrichten klickt und sich eine normale Suchleiste und dann Zeitungsausschnitte äh, an die Stadt gezeigt zu bekommen, die sich eben mit dem Thema beschäftigen. Gar nicht so sehr hat mich dabei gewogen, die Frage, wer steht an erster Stelle, das wissen wir alle, das ist immer das Entscheidendste für, für die Klickrate. Ähm, ist das jetzt New York Times, ist das der Spiegel oder ist es CNN? sondern vielmehr, was, was Nick in der Studie mit seinen Kollegen gezeigt hat, dass, es, dass Google auch diesen Algorithmus, der nicht ganz offensichtlich ist, wie er funktioniert, aber dahingehend verändert hat, dass die Rubrik hier in den News heißt und damit nicht nur klassische Zeitung und Newsmedien, also was wir hier in Deutschland Qualitätsjournalismus nennen, eingefangen wird durch den Algorithmus, sondern auch YouTube-Beiträge, Twitter-Beiträge, Beiträge aus Blogs, Beiträge von PR-Agenturen und demnächst auch vielen anderen. Wo man auch gar nicht weiß, in welchem Verhältnis stehen diese Beiträge oder das Ranking dann zueinander. Aber allein die Tatsache, dass diese Funktion, die einmal gedacht war, um Zeitungs- oder Newsnachrichtenartikel zu konfigurieren, mittlerweile so umfassend ist. Ich bin noch erkältet, das will ich auch sofort weiter mit diesen, diese Idee noch ganz kurz Ende, dass die, dass die ähm, Funktion so, so umfassend geworden ist, dass News, also klassische Qualitätsmedien in Amerika, künftig unter anderem behandelt werden, wie Breitbart News, äh, für Zeichen. Ähm, das sagt doch viel auch über die Entwicklung oder die Erosion des Qualitätsjournalismus in Amerika und wenn wir alle mal darauf schauen, auch in der Lucia's Lab-Reihe, dass vieles von dort vielleicht auch negatives Vorbild, Tendenzen, Entwicklung für Europa sein werden. Eine Frage, die uns auch hier, in, wo wir noch stark, stark, vielleicht stärkere Qualitätsmedien haben, doch auch in den nächsten Jahren umso stärker beschäftigen wird. Deswegen freue ich mich ganz besonders über unseren zweiten Gast ähm, aus Berlin heute, Matthias Spielkamp. 
wird hier Spielkram arbeitet in diesem Bereich. Ähm, Internet Rights äh, und Analysis ist schon seit vielen Jahren und gehört deswegen auch völlig zu Recht zum Gründungsteam von Algorithm Watch, eine, eine noch zu in der Entwicklung befindende NGO, ähm, die sich zum Ziel gesetzt hat, ähm, zu analysieren und erstmal die Frage aufzuwerfen, was sind denn ähm, gesellschaftlich relevante Algorithmen, Entscheidungsmechanismen, die im Netz stattfinden, die wir gar nicht alle durchschauen oder gar nicht wissen, dass es sie gibt oder wo sie eingesetzt werden oder zu welchem Zweck, die, wir, die so relevant sind, dass sie uns als Gesellschaft das Ganze betreffen und die sie deswegen analysieren, verstehen und vielleicht auch kontrollieren müssen. Zu diesem fantastischen oder spannenden Vorhaben, ambitionierten Vorhaben, wird uns Matthias auch gleich etwas erzählen und danach auch in das Gespräch, nämlich genau der Frage, wie das zum Beispiel mit diesen Google-Algorithmen, die News Rankings sein, ist, die relevant die sind, ob man die oder wie man die Kritik kontrollieren, analysieren oder auch gesellschaftlich bewerten muss. Deswegen freue ich mich, dass wir dieses Dream Team heute auf der Bühne haben, um die Diskussion aus Amerika auch dann für unsere Session werden in Deutschland hier gleich mit rüber zu gehen. Danke in diesem Zuge auch ganz kurz, um den Abschluss zu machen, an die Beta House Crew, die uns hier heute wieder zu Gast hat, die sich auch mit dem Thema Amerika Wahlkampf und den Auswirkungen beschäftigt hat, am 3.12. auch am Democracy Camp, dass sie am Januar, am 7. glaube ich, 7. Januar hier fortsetzen wird, zu dem ich sie ganz herzlich auch einladen soll, also mit den Konsequenzen weiter zu machen und was wir, ähm, ja, nicht weiter zu machen, aber zu überlegen, was wir tun, tun können sollten für eine liberale, offene Gesellschaft in der ganz realen Offline-Welt und natürlich im Netz. Darum wird es auch gehen bei unserer nächsten Lunch-Session im Januar, ähm, hier am 24. Januar, die Flyer liegen auf ihrem Sitz, das sage ich jetzt nicht viel mehr, wird es genau um die Frage einer smarten Stadt gehen, die, die Versprechen einer smarten Stadt, äh, Digipolis, aber auch deren Schattenseiten mit unserem Fender so wieder getrieben. Dann am 24. Januar sind sie auch ganz herzlich eingeladen. Nun aber, Nick, I'm on stage, it's your stage. So, herzlichen Dank zu die Dijk-Stiftung und auch hans Holger institut uh, für die Einladung hier. Um, that will be the extent of my German for the rest of today. Um, I'm going to switch to English uh, to share with you um, some results from my research over the past year or so, uh, kind of digging into this question of um, algorithms in the media, algorithms in information intermediaries, and in particular, uh, as they relate to um, Facebook and Google. So it's probably no surprise to the folks in this room uh, that Facebook and Google are really the dominating uh, media distribution these days. 44% of US adults get news on Facebook, 62% uh, from uh, social media, more than half of the US adults get news from Google, and uh, a recent study from the Parsley Media uh, Tracking Network uh, basically came out last week and said 80% of the traffic to news sites is coming through Facebook and Google. Um, so that, that's pretty substantial, and, and especially for publishers that are relying on an advertising model and who need large traffic volumes, they're really kind of hooked on Google and Facebook as distribution mechanisms. Now, Facebook, uh, if you've been keeping up with the news, has been under some, uh, some pressure, some fire recently, in the wake of the US elections, uh, this piece, this headline from uh, a piece that Emily Bell wrote, um, uh, putting some pressure on Facebook and, and criticizing them for not really tending enough to the truth and the sort of proliferation of, uh, of fake news on the platform. Uh, what are Facebook's responsibilities here? Um, in the months since the election, a lot of people are now talking about this issue, ways to improve the situation, uh, you know, choking advertising dollars off, uh, you know, perhaps uh, coming up with other algorithms, uh, algorithmic techniques to combat fake news and so on. 
Um, just to give you an, an idea of the extent of this problem, um, BuzzFeed has actually been, uh, yes, BuzzFeed actually publishes more than uh, listicles and cat videos. Um, they have actually been quite hot on this fake news uh, topic and have published some really interesting uh, original results. So uh, this is a graph from one of their studies where they basically showed that uh, in the three months leading up to uh, the election in November, that the top 20 um, fake news stories on Facebook got more traffic, got more engagement, I shouldn't say more traffic, they got more engagement, so more shares and reactions and comments than the top 20 uh, news articles from mainstream media. So we're really kind of seeing uh, this starting to quantify uh, the implications of having widespread, um, widely shared fake news. Again, a lot we don't know about how this affects people's voting patterns. You know, did this really shift people's opinions substantially, um, or uh, you know, are, are, we're just kind of, kind of starting to grapple with the magnitude of this issue. Going back a few years, although we, we do have some much stronger evidence of the impact of Facebook uh, in elections, uh, not particularly about uh, pushing you to vote for one person or, or another, but simply pushing you to turn out and vote at all, and the implications and the power of Facebook as a platform for uh, getting people to their polling uh, location. So uh, let me just parse this graph for you uh, for a moment. So what this is showing, and this is based on Facebook internal data, so you know, sort of a trusting now and then. What they did was uh, a study in the, in the um, 2012 elections in the US where they had two conditions. Um, they had the control condition in which people saw a normal amount of hard news content in their news feed. And then they had this boosted condition. And the boosted condition basically just turned up the knob of hard news in your newsfeed so you would see more politics-related uh, stories and so on. So what effect did that have on turnout? Well, uh, in the top panel, you can see it says 1 to 29 days. In the bottom panel, it says every day. I in both conditions, you see from the control to the boosted condition, the turnout number went up. Uh, however, you see more of, uh, of uh, an increase in the boosted condition in the in the top panel where people were less uh, were were not logging in every day, uh, so the so the one interpretation is that um, if you're saturated with news coverage, so if you're logging in every day, there's a kind of a mitigated effect. But if you log in less frequently, um, this effect of of seeing more news in your newsfeed is has a greater impact on your likelihood to turn out. So. Just let this sink in for a second. We're not even talking about Facebook pushing people toward one candidate or another. We're just talking about them turning people out at all. And the power of Facebook, of course, comes from their ability to target different demographics. And so if they were to apply this differentially, simply by showing more news to people from particular municipalities or from particular parties, in theory, that would uh, turn out more votes for that, um, for that party or in that municipality. And the implications of that are, of course, when we're talking about uh, elections that are won or lost on 10 or 20,000 votes, uh, this can have substantial implications. So all of that is kind of a, a long introduction to this idea of algorithmic accountability and the need to start investigating and explaining these types of algorithmic effects uh, as they arrive in the public and private sectors. Um, as a journalist myself, I'm thinking a lot about how journalists, uh, as well as others, can characterize this bias, this power, this influence of the algorithm uh, to start to quantify, to start to under understand and trace the implications for these systems. Uh, and then also kind of flipping things around and also thinking about, well, if we're training the next generation of designers and developers of these systems, how can we develop more ethical frameworks, more ethical processes, so that they're taking accountability into, into their own design process as they create these things? So let me talk a little bit more about algorithmic accountability as it applies to Google in the election. This is something that um, where myself and my research lab have done uh, some empirical work. So 
This work is motivated largely by this study that was published last year in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences, uh, PNAS. Uh, the study uh, coined this phrase, the search engine manipulation effect, S-E-M-E. -E. And what the study showed is actually a series of studies uh, in which they created their own search engine, so they weren't looking at Google or Microsoft or anything like that. A very controlled, this is a laboratory experiment, psychologists running this. So they, cr they, they cooked up their own search engine and they populated it with controlled content. Uh, and um, in condition A, for instance, the first two pages are content that is pro one candidate, so supporting that candidate, and then a third page of kind of neutral results, and then page four and five of the search engine would be pro the other candidate, right? So you have a very um, clearly biased ranking at the top of the, uh, the, top of the um, results, you see very pro results for one candidate, at the bottom of the results you see pro results for another candidate. Condition B uh, flips those, um, and, and what they found in their study is that even just biasing information this way can lead to people using the search engine um, voting more for one candidate or the other candidate based on who is privileged in that ranking. Uh, and and the, the effect is not uh, insubstantial. Uh, it's you know, on the order of 10 to 20 percent in some cases, depending on dem demographics and other characteristics. Okay, fine. So we can, we can nudge people in different directions to vote for different people or different candidates. Um, but in these first two studies, A and B, there were also about one in four people who noticed that, right? So they kind of were using the search engine and thought, oh, this is kind of biased. Uh, you know, what the heck is going on here? So, you know, if you really want to manipulate uh, uh, people's perceptions, maybe you want to make it harder for them to realize that they're being uh, manipulated. So, and that's what they were playing with in conditions D and E in the study, where on the first page they actually had a distractor result uh, that was kind of pro the other candidate. I, even though the rankings are still very much biased toward, toward the first candidate on the first couple of pages. Uh, and same effects, so you can still nudge people to vote one way or another, but people are far less likely to recognize and notice that bias. So only about 1% of their participants uh, recognize this. So, again, series of experiments, thousands of, of, uh, of participants in these experiments, but still controlled experiments. You know, this, you know, we, we want to know whether or not these types of effects are actually seen in, in real search engines. And so that's kind of what motivated us and, and my lab at the University of Maryland to look at Google, uh, the most popular search engine on the planet, uh, and start searching for different candidates. So this is what you would see when you search for Hillary Clinton. So you've got you know, your, your in the news results at the top and then you have your, your, t your uh, 10 links kind of listed out there and then you have some other uh, inserted information, some images and some structured data uh, that Google has assembled for you. And the question that we wanted to ask to begin with was, well, if I search for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or any of the other um, uh, potential nominees at the time, since we did this actually last December, this was almost a was actually over a year ago now, uh, we wanted to know um, how much content that was showing up in that first page of results was pro the candidate uh, versus uh, against the candidate. So for each of those links, we, we set up a scraper so we would automatic, automatically collect data from Google for each of the candidates. Uh, and then we would label each of those links and say, you know, how favorable is that link to that um, candidate? So here's kind of the, the breakdown and, and uh, across the Republican field on the top and then the Democratic field on the bottom. Uh, again, I mentioned, you know, there were a lot of people in the field um, uh, in November of 2015 and we collected data on all of them. Um, in the orange uh, colors, you see uh, pages that were labeled as uh, con or very con, so um, uh, information against the candidate. In gray is neutral, and then in purple and blue um, is information that's uh, positive uh, for the candidate. Uh, and you can kind of see some, some gross trends here. Uh, for Republicans, there's more orange on the map, uh, and for Democrats, there's more purple. Uh, so you can kind of see a little bit of a, of a um, bias there in terms of the amount of negative information that shows up around um, Republicans. And also you can see outliers like Bernie Sanders, he was 
all dark purple except for one neutral result. So just very, very positive pro-Bernie uh, pro results. Um, I don't know, maybe the Bernie bros were gaming the, the system. Um, another way to look at this uh, is to kind of chart by result rank. So uh, starting from one on the left-hand side down to the 10th result, so that's marching down the, the, the page. Uh, and then plotting the favorability score of, uh, of the pages that show up in, in each spot in the ranking. And then broken out by Republicans, Democrats, and then the overall average. So a couple, a couple of um, patterns you can see here. Uh, the blue line is above the red line uh, in all cases. So uh, again, kind of reflecting that this uh, more positivity, more favorability toward Democratic candidates. Uh, but also this other trend of both these lines kind of tapering off as you move down the page. So very, very favorable information at the top of the page and slightly, slightly less favorable, but still favorable information at the bottom of the page. Um, and so what you're seeing there is uh, things like social media accounts, uh, pages that are controlled by the, um, by the candidates themselves at the top of the list, and then uh, some, in some cases, negative news stories and so on at the bottom of those search rankings. Okay, so that was sort of an initial foray. Uh, in March of this year, uh, Google launched this, uh, this idea of, um, of uh, candidate info boxes. Um, so if you search for Donald Trump, uh, you would get pointed toward this page. Uh, it's the On the Issues page. Uh, and this is Google's attempt to sort of explicitly curate information related to each of the candidates. Uh, and so on the left-hand side, uh, there's different issues, immigration is at the top, abortion, guns, foreign policy, and so on. Uh, and you can kind of read through these. Um, and then if you expand any of those, you would actually be um, shown a carousel with snippets or quotes extracted from news media. So Google has Google News, they're tracking all the news media, or much of the news media that's, that's uh, talking about the candidates. And they're algorithmically curating quotes in which the candidate has said something that their algorithm deems relevant to that topic. So, all kinds of issues with this, right? Uh, Google's privileging certain issues based on the ranking, right? We know at the top of the ranking gets a lot more attention. So Google has, ar has already framed our debate in terms of immigration, abortion, and guns. And incidentally, I should mention, you only see the top five issues unless you click another button that says show me more. So, Google is really focusing our attention on the top of that list. But also other interesting things pop up when we started looking at the data here. So we, so we scraped out all of the quotes and all of the uh, media sources and so on uh, from each of these carousels for each of the candidates. This was a little bit later in the process, so we were just focusing on uh, Bernie and Hillary and Donald Trump. Uh, and a few things popped out. So you can see this is the number of quotes uh, um, for each of the candidates. Uh, broken, broken out by three uh, data collection periods. Uh, and you can see Bernie and Hillary kind of have a similar number of quotes. Donald, not so many quotes. So um, Google is kind of, was kind of privileging uh, quotes from um, the liberal candidates uh, in their presentation. Now, we, we also know, based on data, that Trump was getting a lot more coverage and there were more articles being written about Trump but that wasn't uh, being uh, factored into what was presented in, in those info boxes. And then finally, we can kind of do a breakdown and see um, how, how many, oh sorry, how many, more Trump, how many more cards Clinton has than Trump in the different, uh, uh, 17 different issues. And you can see she's beating him in terms of coverage and everything except immigration, uh, budget spending, and, and veterans, uh, where he has a little bit of an edge. So um, we can't necessarily w say why this is the case, uh, but we're kind of at the phase where we're trying to describe what we're seeing from the search engine. We're trying to describe um, the, sh the shape and the pattern of information that these algorithms are giving. Finally, I just want to say quickly that we're, you know, we've also recently delved into this in the news box uh, where we're trying to understand how the search engine is framing individual candidates uh, from a news perspective and what uh, news links it's surfacing. Uh, if you search uh, for certain things, certain topics on Google, you'll be presented with this in the news box and it will show you three top news articles. 
So we collected some new data. Actually, it was just down to Hillary and Donald Trump. Uh, this was over the summer. We got about 5,600 links over a period of six weeks. Uh, and we, we weren't looking at localization or personalization, so we just did a collection based on our server in Northern Virginia. And we started aggregating by the type of source, so the, so the media outlet, uh, the media outlets that had the most frequent um, representation in those in the news spots. And you can see some striking patterns, like CNN and New York Times dominate 44% of the coverage of the candidates when you search for them on Google and, and see the in the news box. Other, other outlets, NBC News, Washington Post, USA Today. How about Twitter? Twitter.com actually uh, got 4.5% uh, got four, 4 of the links there. Working our way down, also some links from YouTube. Uh, there were also some links from <coughs> Donald Trump's own page. There were some links from the FBI pages. Uh, we even found a link from RT in there. We found some Breitbart links. I mean, the real garbage was getting filtered up and highlighted by Google in this in the news box. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, within about a week after the election, uh, and of course they said this was already in the works and had noth nothing to do with this uh, being published, but within a week after the election, uh, they, they started rolling out um, a change in framing. So um, it's no longer called in the news, I guess because it's not really news. Um, and they're calling it top article instead. Um, one other thing we, we looked at and were interested in was the temporal bias to understand uh, how old the news information was that was shown in, the, in those in the news uh, boxes. You can kind of see this nice shape that's uh, over the course of a day as something ages out. Uh, it's mu much less likely to be found in the news. We do see uh, a small uh, percentage of links that are a day or two or even three days old. Um, but this gives you a sense of Google's definition of news is really anything that's been published in the last 24 hours for the most part. Okay, so there's lots of challenges. Uh, I'm sure we can get into these in discussion in a minute, but just to sort of sketch some of them out, uh, these, are, these, are, these studies are just scratching at the surface. There's so much more to do here. Um, there, there's a lot more research to do. Uh, you know, we need to find um, sustainable ways to run these studies during political campaigns so that the public knows how their information is being, um, is being presented to them and, and curated for them through these platforms. Um, it's difficult to, you know, systems are constantly changing, so you have to do this over time. Uh, there are sampling issues, like uh, is a Google search in Washington, D.C. the same as in Washington State? I don't know. We need to run the study to understand how much variation there is. There's a transparency deficit. Um, we don't know a lot about what went on on Facebook during the election. Uh, we don't know who was targeted by ads on Facebook. Uh, we may never know, because I don't think it's possible to go back and audit that now, uh, unless uh, Facebook were forced to divulge, divulge that as part of some uh, transparency policy. We don't really even know how big the, face, the fake news problem is. Uh, you know, there have been a few studies from BuzzFeed kind of trying to trace the contours of that. We think it's kind of big, uh, but it would be good to do a study to really measure how big that is. Um, and then, uh, you know, we need to think about regulation. From the, from the American context, it's quite difficult to regulate uh, speech. Uh, you know, I think it's something we need to be very careful and deliberate and concerned about. But I think it is time to start moving in that direction for certain types of information. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to me, Mat Matthias. Um, I, I would invite you to my website and to read up on any of these papers. Uh, also, this is teamwork, so working with my team at University of Maryland and supported by the Knight Foundation and the Tau Center. So, thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. And looking at my watch, I suggest that I use the shorter version of the presentation. <laughs> I think that's the one, yeah. 
is it? No, it's not, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll just skip through most of the slides because we need to um, start uh, the Q&A. Um, just quickly, um, Nick was a great inspiration in founding this uh, initiative, actually, because he wrote a paper in 2015, and the, um, in, or it came out in January, I think, um, algorithmic accountability reporting. You know, I put some emphasis on the re reporting part here because there was a lot of, not a lot of, but there was some work on algorithmic accountability before that, but not on the reporting part. Um, Nick said he's a journalist, right? He's a computer scientist, but he's also a journalist. And that was something that actually made some waves through the international journalism community, at least small parts of it, because people thought, ah, there's a thing here that journalists should look into. And that's why um, we started, I started looking into and um, putting together a team of people, um, and we worked out a proposal for a, um, for a German foundation that had put out a call on data journalism. Unfortunately, we didn't get the money, but the thing is that um, the three of us at the time, we decided that it was a good idea to start an initiative that then later became known as Algorithm Watch. We got the um, fourth person on board, um, and that's the team right now. We have a computer scientist, Katharina Zweig, from the University of Kaiserslautern. Um, she's a specialist on uh, algorithms and uh, graph analysis. We have Lorena Jaume Palassi, who is a um, political philosopher. Um, we have um, Lorenz Matzat, whom, whose name might be familiar to some people here because he's one of the more prominent data journalism, uh, journalists in Germany and myself. Now, uh, most of the stuff that I'm telling you now, you can look up, or that I won't tell you now because we are short of time, you can look up uh, on the website, our mission statement um, and our manifesto, uh, in which we say that it's a very good idea to, um, to use algorithms in our daily life. We've been using them for quite a while. We call it um, automated decision making or algorithmic decision making to also give people um, an idea that we are looking at this from a more holistic point of view. It's not the algorithm itself, it's the database, it's the whole concept of um, how these systems work that uh, needs to be looked at. And what does that mean, looking at it? And now I'll uh, start skipping through these things here. And this is, a, um, this is an infographic that we produced that's not complete. It's like a, um, it's like a work in process. You know, we, are, we keep thinking about how to improve that, but it gives you an idea who's part of algorithmic decision working uh, structures, who's working on them. You, you, need, um, you need researchers who develop an analytical met method and the uh, data pre-selection. You, in the implementation phase, you still have researchers, but you already have uh, data scientists working on them, uh, on these systems. You have the people who actually use them. Um, and those can be governments, those can be private entities, it can be NGOs. Um, also, you already have the learning environment that plays a big role here, and especially people who know about the Tay example, the Microsoft chatbot, know that the learning environment can be pr uh, pretty harsh, you know. That was a, um, a chatbot that Microsoft uh, published or put out on the web, and 14 hours later, they had to kill it again because it had turned into a racist, sexist machine that was, you know, splurting out um, uh, racist and sexist um, uh, info information. I don't even know where you, we don't want to call that information, but things during that day. So um, they had to take it off the web again. So talking about this, the, the learning environment there um, was basically us. I mean, it was most likely not one of the persons in the room here who interacted with Tay, or is there one? Is there someone here in the room who interacted with Tay and made him a her, a racist, sexist machine? No? Okay. <laughs> but anyway, could have been, because that's the learning environment. So that means that we as a society also share the responsibility of the outcomes of these systems, right? So looking at the complexity of this, of course, the question is, what can an initiative, we are, I, I always say initiative, because we're not really an organization yet. We're in the process of becoming an organization, but right now we're still an initiative. What can you do about that? And I think actually, as uh, Nick already said, there's a ton of things that we can do. Um, I'll go over the issues here. Ways to investigate algorithms, right? 
we can do journalistic investigation and reporting. There has been tremendous stuff. Nick has done some things. Uh, ProPublica has done some great reporting on algorithmic bias with uh, interesting stories on, for example, risk analysis that uh, is being used to uh, do an analysis of what the risks of being um, of um, um, uh, people in, in jail in the United States are once they are released from jail and they found out that they are not only wrong, which is a problem in itself, but they are also discriminatory against blacks. Um, of course, we need computer science. We need statistical analysis and some reverse engineering, which is hard, very hard to do, especially when the systems are really complex. We can talk about this in a minute. We need legal analysis, for example, to find out what is allowed, what might be against the law that is being used, but we could also use st uh, strategic litigation. Um, one example that is pretty prominent here in Germany is the Schufa, the credit scoring agency that was taken to the Bundesgerichtshof, the um, highest German civil court. Um, in the end, the Schufa succeeded by um, saying that the, the system itself that they were using um, needs to be protected um, and the court ruled in favor of them, but that's probably not the last word on that. We need advocacy, meaning that uh, we need campaigns to make the public more aware of what uh, is happening. And these campaigns can come from different um, perspectives. One of the reasons why, at least that's my interpretation of why Mark Zuckerberg now admitted that there actually is a problem with fake news is because of that. There was a campaign. Now, journalists are usually pretty um, held back uh, to call something a campaign because that is something that advocacy organizations do and journalists, of course, only report the facts, but we know how contested that, that view is. And the fact that there was so much criticism of the fake news issue um, basically meant that, um, that uh, Facebook uh, retracted uh, or, or stepped back on their position and um, basically made a 180% uh, uh, or a degree turn on that. Um, and we need philosophy, and this is the last thing I'm going to say because this is one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, the, um, the Zeit Stiftung uh, gave uh, Lorena um, Jaume Palassi and myself a fellowship, a Bucerius fellowship, to analyze the ethical um, implications of this whole thing, because in our opinion, one of the first steps one needs to take is to find out what the algorithms are that we need to look at. You know, we have electronic toasters that look at uh, whether the, the uh, slice of bread is already ready uh, or not. We don't want to look at that from an algorithm watch perspective, right? Of course it needs to work and it can't turn out uh, burnt um, uh, toasts uh, all the time, but that's not a problem that, that we are trying to, um, trying to look at. But when you take this further, you all of a sudden realize that there is a problem here because use Facebook as an example, or you can use Google as an example. These are private companies that have um, terms of service, and the people who use these, these services, they have agreed to these terms of service. Now, what is the grounds for asking them to be more accountable to a general public than to ask someone else to be accountable to a general public, to ask the company, the General Electric, that produces the electronic toaster, right? So, you can imagine that we think there are some grounds to do that, but we need to define those, and uh, that's really important. And uh, I, I think Nick is the perfect person to talk um, about with this because he also very much focuses on the ethics of um, this whole field of algorithmic accountability. Okay, um, that's my short introduction to Algorithm Watch. Whoops, that was too fast. <coughs> I'll put this last slide up again so you can see what the um, what the um, pages URL is, and of course the Twitter account, and uh, then let's talk, Nick. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you one question, just one, because we need to give you the opportunity to ask questions, and since it's a lunchtime thing, m many people probably have to go back to work, although they don't want to, they want to stay with us for the whole afternoon, but you can't, so um, I'll, I'll make this quick. Um, there is a couple of um, Guardian articles that have come out in the recent uh, weeks, harshly criticizing Google for, for example, um, showing um, search results that uh, 
I, I, I use an example. When you, when you start typing in, um, is the Holocaust, and then you use autocomplete, one of the first um, examples of what, of, of one of the first suggestions that autocomplete makes is, is, is uh, has the Holocaust really happened? Something like that. I, it might not be completely precise. Has the Holocaust really happened? And when you, when you choose that as your search term, you get tons of examples of pages like Stormfront and other uh, Nazi sites that uh, explain to you that the Holocaust didn't really happen, right? Um, of course we know that's not true, but then um, the criticism comes from a perspective that says, yeah, but Google has to do something about that. Um, now, first question is, does Google have to do something about this? Secondly, um, I, I'll make this a little more complicated because um, Google, of course, always answers to these, uh, to these questions. Well, you know, we are just showing what the web says is the most relevant article, right? If for, the, for those of you um, who know how Google works, it's pretty obvious who, who, for, those, for those who don't. You know, Google basically, there's a ton of signals that they use, but one of the most important, sig important signals is that how many uh, pages link to a certain web page and then it gets highly ranked. And there are probably some or many people in the world who link to those Stormfront articles, right? But then uh, a search engine analyst said, yeah, but the strange thing is, it's not really true. These articles that pop up on the top of the search engine, uh, of, this, of the result pages, are not the most popular ones. It's now, what's your take on that when we are discussing this issue? What do we know and what can we do? <coughs> yeah, wow, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think Google's That's response question, right? yeah. Google's response has been to you know react to the you know the surfacing of this information and sort of um, scrub the worst of it uh, as I think um, uh, as a way to almost calm people down and maybe maybe get them um, off their back uh, but there's a deeper point there which is um, the criteria that Google has built into the search engine um, are somehow leading us to an information environment where these types of things do pop up and are uh, popular or are brought to the top of, of the ranking. And so, uh, you know, I think Google really needs to think about uh, what is the most effective way forward. You know, do they do they really think that they can solve this with algorithms, or do they need to in, in integrate more of a human decision process on perhaps a certain subset of potentially problematic searches. Now, I want to bring up one criticism to these series of, of Guardian articles, um, and it has to do with the magnitude of the problem. So if you type is, you know, or are Jewish people blank and let Google complete it for you, um, how often does that search really happen? Ten thousand times a year? It's not that much, according to Google AdWords. Um, so it's kind of like the Guardian found some some dog crap on your shoe, and you have to scrape it off. But is it? Is it really a problem? I mean, you don't want to bring that shoe inside, but is it really, is it really a problem? I don't know. I mean, you would have to, in other words, you would have to be really looking for it to get to this information. And if you're really looking for it, then you will really look for it regardless of whether or not Google is auto-completing it. So there's a question there about human behavior and also about input bias. What do people really search for? What are, their, what are the real search terms? So I it's perhaps a flimsy argument to just cook up whatever search term you think you can find to get Google to show you some nasty results. Okay, I said I'd ask one question, but I need to ask this one follow-up because that is basically a, a great um, answer leading into that question of, we are talking about now, after the elections in the United States and the elections coming up in Germany, talking a lot about fake news here as well. 
And we have some proposals on the table uh, saying that we need sanctions against fake news. You know, we need up to 500,000 euros uh, penalty on, on fake news that uh, are being published on, on Facebook, for example, and stay there, although people say this is fake news, right? Um, at the same time, um, at least that is my impression, except for you know, the Hans Bredo Institute and a very few other institutions in Germany and Europe, there's not a lot of research being done on, this, on these questions. And you just um, uh, pointed to, to, uh, to this when saying, we don't really know what the magnitude of the problem is. Now, what's your take on that? What, what do we need right now when it comes to algorithmic accountability? Do we need sanctions to um, force companies to do some thing or the other, or do we need something else? Uh, well, I think, I think sanctions are a very slippery slope, particularly I think the minister proposed like 500,000 euros for an article, an item of fake news that wasn't taken care of within 24 hours. Uh, I think that's a really dangerous um, direction uh, to take things because um, it's easy to imagine that kind of law being misused. Uh, it's easy to imagine uh, puppets um, raising this issue, puppets that are controlled by foreign <coughs> powers that are raising uh, this issue in order to get at a corporation. Uh, in other words, I, I think it's the kind of thing that can be easily gamed. Um, and I think we need to find a different solution to that particular um, question. In terms of the, you know, understanding the magnitude of the problem, I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done. I would love to see some kind of um, panel approach where in order to understand the personalization, um, you know, and this would be a massive uh, government national effort to build a panel, almost like a survey panel, uh, but a panel that has maybe like some kind of browser plugin uh, that would report back what you're seeing uh, when you visit Facebook, when you visit Google, and who you then have permission to use that data in order to run studies and evaluate the personalization, how different people are seeing the web, um, you know, based perhaps on their demographic characteristics or their location. Um, I think that kind of effort is, would, would take a, a lot of cash, quite frankly, uh, to recruit a panel, to run it, to make it sustainable, um, and to do so in, you know, way, in ways that are privacy preserving and so on. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we're talking about needing to measure the magnitude of these issues, needing to um, just get more information about what's going on. And I think to do it, we need a counterweight to these platforms. These platforms make billions of dollars every year, um, you know, showing us ads. So we, we need a counterweight, and it's going to need to be more than um, a drop in a bucket. Okay, so over to you. Are there questions already? Thank yeah, you and much. you know, why not a Russian engine while you're at it or a Chinese one? They, and they already have their own search engines. And, and it's because they don't want to be influenced by Western, the Western monopolies. Um, you know, China makes it very difficult to do business uh, in China as a, as a media company. Um, you know, and Russia has their own, um, their own options there too. So, sure. The EU should build their own option, and you know I think um, more diversity of options would benefit not just European citizens, but perhaps uh, citizens in the U.S. or elsewhere who want access to um, the values that that type of um, search engine might might build into it. Um, I, I'm trying to remember. Did France? try to do this? It was Europe, actually. It, it was, was Europe. the European okay. search engine that popped up about, I don't know, how long ago was that? Eight years ago, probably? Uh, no, no, no. It was a European-led uh, consortium that made that search engine, and it, it disappeared quietly afterwards. I think uh, on the first day of operation, it crashed, and they said, um, we'll be back in three months. And that was the last thing I heard of it. So... I mean, it doesn't mean that it can't be done. It just means it was tried and didn't succeed. Um, but of course, you can always argue that a very, very dynamic um, structure like a search engine is not really the best thing to be operated by a 
not I wouldn't even call it government run, but by a um, an endeavor run on European funding. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I wouldn't call it a monopoly yet, but I mean, in Germany it is, uh, in a sense, yeah, but the discussion, I mean, the, the results are still out. There is a competition, um, uh, um, what's it called, a, a competition case um, in the EU looking into whether Google is misusing its, um, its powers, um, for example, displaying their own search results on the top of the page where there should be competitor search results displayed there. Um, but we, um, I mean, it's, I, 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 I like the, the case a lot. I mean, the, the fact that it's being, that Google is being probed on that. Um, but we haven't heard any results from that yet. I mean, some results, they said, yes, they will open the case. They have enough substantial evidence that they can do it, but not a lot more. Okay. Jens Jeb, ich bin Notar, also Jurist, I'm a civil law notary, and I, I kind of strongly oppose this idea that Europe would be in any way able to do it just better because it's Europe. I mean, the whole thing, the whole idea of a social network has to be a monopoly. Because if it's not a monopoly, it doesn't work. I mean, if you have 10 social networks, the whole idea doesn't work. So we, I think we have to live with the idea that probably Facebook will, for a long time, the monopoly. But then, that's what we do as lawyers. We try to regulate. So we have to think about what do we do with them. So how do we regulate it? How do we help them yeah, uh, and help us to avoid fake news? But it's not that Europe can do it better. I mean, it's the same Europe that messed up Greece. It's the same Europe with Volkswagen who cheated and like produced a big, big loss to all of us. It's the same Europe that... No, but, but, uh, but it's Europe, it's, it's a European Communion. Uh, folks from cheated, uh, produced a massive, massive loss, and nobody looked at it. So it's not just because it's Europe, it's going to be better. And you can't just take something private, something that works, and say we do a governmental thing, it's going to be better. That doesn't work. But we have to find good regulation, and regulation can't be just to penalize it, but we have to avoid, of course, fake news. So we have to implement some system to identify them and to get rid of them very, very quickly. And our system at the moment, the courts, the legal system, is not fit at all to do this. Not at all. So it's just months and years uh, later when we decide on those things. So we have to probably get special courts. We have to get special measurements. We have to find a system to report those fake news, check if they're really fake news and not just opinions, freedom of speech, and then probably tell Facebook first, stop showing those ads to us, or those news. Second, maybe replace them with the real news. So if they're really fake, maybe show everyone in his timeline, this is the truth, this was fake, and probably identify the first guy who ever posted it. And then you might think about like punishing this first one. But if you don't get the first one, you will never be able to punish anybody on legal grounds. Nick, any comments on that? No, I'm going to pass. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Oh, uh, well, um, I think, uh, I think, I think the company is not the bomb. I think the company figured out an, in, uh, an interesting um, way to weaponize social media, which is everyone loves a good quiz. Uh, why don't we circulate quiz games and, oh, by the way, these Quiz games have been validated so that we can learn your personality profile in the course of completing the quiz. So this company has been circulating quizzes for years, gathering um, background or information on whoever's filling out quizzes on Facebook. Um, so the, the bomb, I think, is not that a company is doing that. Th that company can do it, another company can do it. The bomb is this ability to target political advertising on the scale of an individual or perhaps on the scale of personality profile. Um, and, you know, how, how susceptible are individuals to seeing a Facebook ad? I don't know. Um, probably not very susceptible. I mean, it would, I don't think it would have changed my vote. 
uh, to see, you know, some kind of uh, ad on Facebook. Um, but we're talking about maybe one or two percent of people who are susceptible to that. Um, and I don't want to make any judgments about who those people are, but let's just say there's some small subset of the population that could be swayed by that kind of thing. And now you have this capability, this weaponization of social media that's able to just twist a little bit. And you only need 2% to win. So that's where it's being um, fought and won or lost. And the other question about, uh, you know, the differentiation between um, fake news and propaganda, I, I mean, I think, th I think there is a substantial difference. I, I think um, it has to do with the, um, you know, to some extent, the, the, the nature of the content. I mean, fake news is uh, invented. It's imaginary. It, there's no grounding whatsoever uh, in any kind of reality, whereas I think propaganda takes a very explicit intent toward trying to manipulate people by grounding some of the information in real events and kind of framing it and twisting it to meet someone's political needs. So I, I do see a differentiation there. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'll blame, you know, I'll flagellate myself, blame the media for being so uh, imprecise in their use of this term, fake news. That's great, you know, it makes for a great headline, but, you know, we, we need to be smarter about how we're talking about these things. And it's not all just propaganda, it's not all just fake news. Um, we need to differentiate them and, and, and take appropriate actions. Yeah, I, as my last comment, second you on that, because the, um, first of all, is I, we could easily discuss the question of what fake news actually is for the rest of the afternoon here today, and probably not come up with a good answer that basically everyone can agree on. Um, and then the, the other thing is that um, <coughs> when we are looking at um, what the influence of, I mean, combining those two questions, Cambridge Analytica and what they're doing, um, the psychologist who uh, was basically the, the protagonist of that story has had an interview or was interviewed for the Tuts uh, in the last weekend, so you probably want to look that up on the web because he's sort of stepping back and saying, yeah, well, you know, it w I was misrepresented uh, in that story, in that original story that made such headlines here in Europe or in Germany. Um, and and the, I think the nexus between those stories is that um, we should... First, probably not overestimate the influence <coughs> of Facebook when it comes to the American election, and certainly not when it comes to the German elections that are coming up, right? I mean, um, we have a situation where basically there's, even if you think that like two or three percent of voters can be swayed in one specific demographic group, um, the most important demographic group that, so as far as we know now, was responsible for Trump's success was the people who, um, the the a group of white people with no college or other degrees, right? Those are the people who are the least likely to use Facebook and be influenced by Facebook, right? So if we look at that, it might give us a different perspective on the influence of that immensely powerful and monopolistic social um, media or social network that we're talking about all the time. So um, I would just say that the problem is that we don't know enough right now and we need more research instead of more suggestions of how we can sanction all these evil companies. Okay. Agre agreed. Okay. Thanks a lot. And that was it for today. Um, Danke. Thanks again. Thanks again for Hans Bredow Institute and uh, the Zeitstiftung and now in, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>